All right, welcome back to the Conversion Stack. Awesome episode today. We got Tyler Davis back and we are talking the convergence of data-driven marketing and creative marketing. There's this world of what I'm calling creative performance campaigns that's increasingly important. We're gonna dig into ugly industries that typically don't do creative things. We're gonna talk about insurance companies like Aflac and how the heck they made like these boring companies into like really sexy, engaging brands. Um, and even our process of how we create really engaging, creative campaigns and, and take that into the performance marketing world. So Tyler, I'm pumped to dig in and let's do it. We got Tyler Davis. Hey guys. You pumped? I'm, I'm really excited. Nice. And today we are talking creativity and brand marketing in a data-driven world. It's a tough one. It's a tough one, specifically the latter. When data gets involved, it gets complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's cool. I live in a... I, you've heard, probably heard me say this a lot. I, I love ugly software. I like ugly industries and I call them ugly, but just like, you know, the less sexy industries. Um, and I come from a background of marketing analytics and, and, and data driven marketing. And, um, now I'm kind of finding this new passion for, for creativity. I think to think just winning through data driven marketing is not good enough. The mm -hmm. consumer is so advanced now that you need data-driven marketing, but you also need to merge it with like creativity and, and brand messaging and, yeah, yeah. and effective communication. And, and I think I'm, I'm kind of excited to chat through and, and just keep digging into a world where we merge creativity and like data-driven yeah, marketing. I think one thing that you just pointed out there, you didn't say it, but you said it indirectly. No matter the content, you can find a way to make it interesting. You yeah. can find a way to tell a story uh, regardless of the challenge and the solution that you're presenting. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting that you said was regardless of the industry. So let's go ahead and call out some boring industries before we get any further. Cause I think that's important. That sets yeah. the stage for a conversation today. What are some of the harder industries that you've found when it comes to creative campaigns? Hmm. Well, I, when I say, I, I don't, when I say boring, I don't mean hard, but boring to me is, you know, a lot of the energy in the world goes after the sexy software, right? The Airbnbs, the Snapchats, mm -hmm. like everyone wants to work with those types of companies. But I, I think a lot of the economic activity in the world lives in, you know, call center software yeah, yeah. and logistic software. And a lot of, of the, and that, I call that ugly software just because it's like, it's like backend, you know, CRM. So I consider mm -hmm. ugly software, accounting, yeah. technology. Um, you know, we like, we recently started working with DSOs, which are private equity companies that own dental practices, mm -hmm. so like really hidden high value industries that um, are typically not creative, which is what why I think this is really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll challenge you real quick. Why aren't these industries typically creative? Because if you think about it, some of the more creative industries are like insurance. Yeah. Right. And that's mm -hmm. boring. I mean, I'm, I'm not going home and talking to my wife about insurance. Yeah. <laughs> willingly. <laughs> Um, so why do you think that is? Why do you think these industries are lacking, but, uh, lagging a bit when it comes to creative? creative? I love, I love your insurance example. Cause that's definitely an outlier. Um, and I'd actually, you know, I don't know if I know the reason mm -hmm. why, uh, maybe cause it's such a commodity. They need to stand out and they have mm -hmm. a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Um, so they've somehow maybe driven by Geico success. I, I think they might be the, the leader there. They've all really like, they have mascots. They, mm -hmm. they make us laugh. They do Super Bowl yeah, commercial. Yeah. They really like grabbed onto creativity in, the, in their marketing and advertising. Um, but your question on why they're not creative, um, I think a lot of them are legacy industries and, and they tend to communicate like feature set, right? And like how often do you see a, you know, a accounting software advertisement that is funny or creative, right? And maybe and, into it would be the only one I can think of. Yeah, yeah. And I bet even them, they probably just started doing that in the past five years sure. because they've recognized its need. It's like, yep. hey, now there's twenty other alternative to into mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And just telling me that you're better at cloud based accounting is not <laughs> enough, right? Like their advertisement five years ago was the number one cloud based accounting software. Like, sure. Like how it we gotta stop doing that. Everyone needs to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Every ad six years ago was the number one Blank software at your industry. Everybody's tied at number one, right. like, like golf, <laughs> something of the sort. Um, what is that? What is that? Why is everything, everyone number one, everyone is leading? Does, like, when you play golf, <laughs> does anybody win? And that's the real question. Um, all right, so I think I think that's a good start for us. Let's move into, uh, well, I'll kick it back over to you. What's what's the core of this conversation beyond just creative and the introduction? What's the, the, the basis of what we're talking about today? Yeah, well, I mean, just to like really back 
to us at OM, we have recently rolled out a new offering we call creative performance campaigns. Mm-hmm. Right? And it's this intersection of brand marketing and performance marketing. And obviously, as we flesh that out, as, as being the first time that we pull a specific product out of our core kind of full stack offering, um, we as a company have just been thinking about this a lot. And then we've executed a bunch of these for our clients Mm -hmm. and they're the most successful ads that we run, right? We go through a deep process, it moves slow, but the output are these really unique, creative, full buyer's journey ad campaigns um, that go light years ahead of the number one AI call center software. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, so I think that just kind of this exercise as a company just really has driven me to push this narrative forward. Because, I mean, my goal is to push marketing forward as, yeah. as, as a marketing agency. Um, can, I, yeah. can I stop you right there and pick on you a little bit? Um, to our viewers, this is a behind the scenes look. The other day in a meeting internally, I had something that I crafted very eloquently as mm-hmm. far as like a message that I wanted to get across. And you stopped me, rightfully so, and you said, hey, what does this mean? What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. So let's do the same here. I think you and I understand creative campaigns, and especially you behind the scenes as far as the business. But in one sentence, what are the creative? What type of value do the creative campaigns give our clients? Yeah. No pressure. It's crafting a marketing or advertising message that appeals to emotion. Love it. Emotion's right. big. Yeah, and I think I th- well, let me add one more word. Okay, one more. And tells a story. <laughs> That's three. <Right. laughs> and tells us four. I'm sorry. Right. Um, again, when I see the number one accounting software or the most robust accounting software, it doesn't appeal to emotion. Maybe it gives me a little bit of, of solution clarity. Mm-hmm. And don't get me wrong. I think solution clarity is really important. Right. But the way I want to engage when I start kind of prospecting or navigating new new technology or new companies is I call it engage, educate, build trust, mm-hmm. and drive action. So if the first step of that is someone engaging me or piquing my interest, it needs to be more than solution clarity. Yeah. It needs to be funny, interesting, creative, right? And then if once they've piqued my interest, once they've engaged me, mm-hmm. then they should educate me. Yes, so yes, like, yes. <laughs> um, right? We build the accounting software that will take you to the moon, mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever, that's not funny or creative, <laughs> um, because we have the most robust cloud-based blah, 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 yeah. right? So now I'm, now I'm invested in learning more about this opportunity, mm-hmm. and I think that's how we're going to continue to drive success. In the list of cliches, marketing cliches, I think, take you to the moon is right above or number one. It's, yeah, I it's know. Just it's, like, right. it's good, though. It's better. <laughs> um, I used to work for a virtual clinical trial company that I approached with I want to say creative copy, something more off the cuff and not as buttoned up. And they were pretty reticent to go that route. I think just maybe maybe out of fear, Mm -hmm. maybe out of what's been done in the industry before. And that's directly going to impact our bottom line and the message that we're sending to our consumers. Yeah. Do you see with some of these, quote unquote, let's stop calling them boring industries, but um, legacy or whatever you want to call them. Do you see them having the same mindset when it comes to giving the okay to some of this copy that might be a little more, we'll call it sexy or entertaining? Yeah, I think it's risky. A lot of these ugly industries or less sexy industries have compliance mm-hmm. challenges, which makes being creative difficult. Um, and change is scary, mm-hmm. right? And the nice thing is, like, change is happening. You know, look at us now doing a podcast, right? It's like this look This itself is – podcasts, to me, are part of creative performance marketing. It's like, how do we make this type of engaging content and then deploy it through data-driven ways like, mm-hmm. we, try to, like we want to do? In, mm-hmm. in our own advertising. Um, like, you know, we're doing a podcast. We're I would say we're mid to late to the game. Mm-hmm. Imagine how far a pharmaceuticals company is from sure. doing a podcast. Probably yeah. pretty far unless they have someone really creative that's going to drive the narrative inside the company and get approval. And then their leadership is probably pretty scared of what that means. Like, wait, you're going to go talk yeah. about yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> your, your point about... It, just one person i think what it really means is one person being creative is where it starts yeah Mm -hmm. it starts with the one person that has the personality that has the the guts to go out and do it and then somebody else reels them back right and so one question that i have for you and i know the answer but i think the audience would appreciate this what so we have our channels we we have you know whether it's podcasts whether it's anything digital right 
regardless of how we share our message, what sets us apart? How do we come up with these messages and tell it in a creative way differently from maybe other agencies that are not hitting the mark? Because I think we do a damn good job. Yeah. What makes us, what stands apart from those, those agencies? I think it's process. Mm -hmm. You know, what sets us apart is you know, creativity is a weird thing. I can't just tell you, as you saw with my moon example, <laughs> like you can't just, hey, Tyler, be creative. Be creative, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like, how do we even get to that point, right? We define the objective planning. So we typically create a creative brief, mm -hmm. right? And then we have typically a four to five person brainstorm session. Yeah. Right? And that typically involves the big whiteboard. Now that we do it all digitally, what's the software? Uh, whiteboard. No, the software that kidding. we use. <laughs> digital, uh, I was saying, the joke was digital company that's called whiteboard. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, it's a bad joke. It's, it's a, a bad joke. It's a digital whiteboard where we all collaborate in. Everyone brings basically a whole bunch of ideas based on the brief, right? Mm -hmm. The brief gives you an objective. Hey, we have mm -hmm. this um, accounting software. This is what makes them unique. This is the narrative that we want to get across. Um, people start coming ideas, right? And those ideas yeah. are, one person might think of superheroes. One person might think yeah. of well, like let's, future cars. Let's stop and set the scene because I yeah. interrupted you with a terrible joke and I think it's really important to go back. Um, we have the creative brief. Um, and this is very like structured, right? This is, you know, we're going to set the foundation for what we're talking about. What's our yeah. goal? And I think that's not revolutionary as much as when you take that brief and uh, take it to design and then pair the marketing brain with the design brain and we do a brainstorm, everybody in the company loves those. It's probably, if you ask anybody in the company, it's their favorite thing to do. Yeah, I think it's, it's my favorite thing to do. Why is that? Like, talk to it, put us in the room in this brainstorm. How is that, how does it look and how does it feel different from maybe how other people do it? I think creative freedom is really fun. Mm. Right? Creating an environment where you can come up with a silly idea and not be, quote unquote, punished. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And going back to why companies don't do this, it's, that's a scary thing. And I like to say that, from my experience, in big, slow-moving organizations or these antiquated mm -hmm. type of companies, um, it's safer to not do anything than to be wrong. It's safer right? to not do anything than to be wrong. So it's hard to bring crazy ideas or bring that podcast idea, right? So you need to create environments where it's okay to be silly. It's okay to be wrong, mm -hmm. to get to it right. But again, sure. in a lot of companies, it's better to not take action than to risk being wrong because you don't want to be wrong in some organizations. Um, so maybe that's a little bit of a sidetrack, but um, I think creative freedom and creative freedom is fun in public. Mm -hmm. Like those meetings are great because we, we laugh. We right? do. And we, do. We, and we learn and we realize that that person that would just sometimes monoton monotonously just talk through in a computer mm -hmm. going over an agenda yeah. also has insane ideas about how superheroes can drive accounting software. <laughs> Keyword insane. Um, yeah, um, and it. then what's really fun is eventually you get to a point where this superhero idea or, or whatever example actually makes a ton of sense for that accounting software. Mm -hmm. And that's a really exciting time. And then we dig deep and flesh that out um, and then create examples, prototypes of what that looks like. And very often, because it has so much brain power, it has such nice process behind it, we put those prototypes in front of the client. And other than them helping us filter down to the final options, mm -hmm. I don't think, as many times as we've done this, I don't think we've ever had a client not be impressed with just the prototypes, yeah. <laughs> right? Because yeah, yeah. it's so thought out. It's such a good process. No, one's there, no client has ever come to us and said, hey, guys, we don't want to do the creative campaign. Sure, They're like, sure. This is exactly what we want to do. And it's, I'm so happy you guys got us here. Yeah, I, I've never, since I've worked here, seen anybody walk away from one of those meetings without joy or like just we're super impressed. Yeah. And one thing that I think I want to hit on before we go on to the third step of our creative process um, is the intentionality. Because, yeah, you have something that looks nice when you come up with these creative processes. But to the client, what it means is, hey, we understand your problem. Mm -hmm. We understand the solution. We understand the result. Um, how can we create, say, a formula to take the design and tell them, hey, A plus B equals C, let's come up with creative campaigns that fit within that play, within that sandbox. Yeah. So that it makes it resonates with the client off the bat, regardless of where we go with the creative. I don't think people it's an easy idea, but I don't think people understand that before they jump in and become a bull in the China shop in a lot of instances. I think the challenge is that to get to that stage, we have to really understand our partner. 
um, if I understood your question properly. So it's not, we can't just sign up a new client today and come up with an amazing creative campaign. So yep. we typically yep. start with what I call general strategies, right? Mm -hmm. Like what is their core value proposition? How do we get that out effectively? How do we get it through the stage of the virus journey? But once we really become intimate with their company, mm -hmm. our minds expand and we're able to merge creativity with their value prop yes. and, then, and then get it right. Well said, better said than I. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I think that, I think that, that's just part of the process. And we've definitely had clients that were like, man, why didn't we start with this? And it took, mm -hmm. it took us a while to figure out how your AI insurance technology can get to this level. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're talking about, you're getting into the data point, yeah. essentially. Um, before, we get, before we move into the data, I want to make sure that we wrap up with our creative process. So we have uh, the brief, we have the brainstorm. What's the next step? Concepts. Mm -hmm. Right. So typically we decide two or three directions that we want mm -hmm. and the creative team goes and mocks up examples of that. And that's what we were talking about with the client. Yep. Seeing that and being pretty yep. much uh, overjoyed. And we present to them, hey, here's obviously you guys are aware of our the objective, what we're trying to accomplish. Yep. Right. Um, we've pieced together some options that are visual that you guys can understand and see our process. Mm -hmm. Help us dictate, since you're the subject matter expert, which direction you want us to dig deeper. Yeah. Okay. Um, and once we we're comfortable with that, then, um, and I think this is going to segue into the next piece of this, then performance marketing comes into play. So yeah, cool. Now we have this awesome superhero campaign that has this narrative. Um, and I think that's where in my worldview, a traditional brand agency would stop. They would make a bunch of really sexy superhero campaigns for this QuickBooks mm -hmm. um, or just not QuickBooks. Intuit. Yeah. 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 I'm with accounting you. software. Um, we then want to take that narrative and those visuals and that message and actually bring it back to um, stages of the buyer's journey, the, the journey mapping that we do with our ad strategy, our targeting strategy, yep. our optimization strategy. And now mm -hmm. we're like, okay, we have creative campaigns. Let's let's plug in. Um, <laughs> Crazy. Let's plug in performance marketing. Yeah. Right. And then let's deploy that. And I think that is awesome. Yeah. It sounded like you squished a bug or something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll have to work on that sound effect. But I think I think you drove the point home here. Um, when it comes to the next phase after creative, and that's analyzing the data. Does our creative work? Is there somewhere we need to pivot? Does this messaging resonate as we thought it would? Are we speaking to the right people? Mm -hmm. all, right, all these things that c go into performance marketing outside of just analyzing all the channels and how they speak to each other. Um, okay, so where do we go from here? Um, Let's discuss the uh, shortcomings of the world today. And I think that is, we are segmented in creative performance campaigns. There's a lot mm -hmm. of brand agencies out there. Mm -hmm. And I think brand ag agencies are awesome, by the way. Um, and there's a lot of really good performance companies out there. Okay. Um, so nothing wrong with those, but I think there's shortcomings for each of those. Okay. And we've kind of hinted at those, but let's just kind of walk through them. So you're a brand agency. You're probably a very good at this creative process that we just discussed. And we work with one, right? You would yeah, say? Yeah. 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 We, I mean, we've partnered with brand agencies and hopefully we continue to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, they often struggle deploying those campaigns effectively. Okay, agreed, um, agreed. They either do it through a partner, which sometimes it does, and hopefully that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, but they are just not fundamentally experts at performance marketing. The other part is, so that's a shortcoming if you want to, if you want to help like merge creative and mm -hmm. data-driven marketing. Then on the performance side, you have these really technical marketing companies, kind of where I come from, my background, and fortunately, we have creative people at, at our company that help kind of take us to the next level there, um, that are really good at targeting, really good at buyer's journey, really mm -hmm. good at engaging people through different stages of the engagement data points that we have, um, but are kind of stuck creating the number one accounting software ads. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and I think both of those are no longer enough in today's world. Today's world is really creative mm -hmm. and has a lot of data, right? The platforms yeah. are getting super strong and the expectation of the consumer is the stuff you see on TikTok and Instagram mm. that's just next level. Like how there's the stuff in the world, the content in the world is so next level that getting an individual to stop 
and consume is really tough. And I think that's why this is so important. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it, this is a bit granular, so apologize in advance. But you have to, and we, it goes back to what we talked about earlier with the one creative person, right? And so I think at our at our business, we have a bunch of technical minded folks when it comes to marketing. And then we also have, which sets us apart, creative minds that come from a different background than marketing. Like mm -hmm. for myself, um, you know, eventually took a detour into the world of digital marketing at a young age, but I really started in, in journalism. And so actually radio, news radio, they called me television Tyler. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was all set up to that joke, guys. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. But no, so I started in content and I think before I ever started in digital marketing, I wanted to make people read my content. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to engage with it and I wanted to make them laugh and not in the news, not in the news format, but to me, once you marry those skill sets with the technical digital marketing skill sets, very few agencies have that. Because most kids, or most adults, sorry, mm -hmm. go into digital marketing from the age that they go to college and maybe change their uh, their curriculum. And then from there, they start building the skill sets supposed to, you know, myself, Vlad, another one of our, our coworkers comes from a journalism yep. background, yep. as opposed to these people coming in with the skill sets that are then shaped into and layered upon digital marketing skill sets. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the brand side, I made the mention that we work with a brand agency, but really, I mean, we, we could do all that ourselves and we have the capability. And so we talk about our competitive advantage. Did I articulate that in, in the, do you view it the same way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, I call it full stack marketing and mm -hmm. that is, that is hiring people from both facets and creating systems and processes for them to work together. You know, digital marketing is a giant word. Um, I came out of school, started working for analytics companies mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so i was just a boring marketer that was good at the technical piece mm -hmm. right and then a lot of people that are creative marketers right? mm -hmm. they go into I, don't know, I think i consider journalism creative marketing but like they go into journalism or they go into video production or brand marketing and, yeah. and those are very different skill sets with tons of different things to do and you know i think one way i see the world is like let's bring that together mm -hmm. um, because even though we primarily focus on ugly industries or less sexy industries, the buyer of a accounting software is no different no different from the guy, the buyer of a Bluetooth speaker. Okay. Right? He's still a human that has emotion, yeah. that likes to laugh or be educated or, or be engaged. Mm -hmm. And creativity and engagement is just as important whether you're selling B2B SaaS mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or B2C consumer uh, widgets like Absolutely. Bluetooth or cloth or whatever else. Was that is that a shortcoming and why is that a shortcoming? From the standpoint of we're not treating humans like humans when we speak to them. You know what I mean? Like yeah. some of these legacy companies probably don't speak to you or I if we were their customer with language that resonates with us. It's like a commercial for Humana, I mm -hmm. think is a prescription drug and it's like get rid of X Y and Z symptoms with Humana. And it's like, <laughs> I don't give a damn about that. But um, so why do they struggle with this? What, what's the pain point there? It's tough. That's a tough one. Um, why do they struggle being creative? Why do they struggle being human? I mean, that's yeah. one of our core proponents of our company. I think all of the things we talked about today mm -hmm. can be drawn back to being human. Yeah, I'll tell you one, ex one, one that I think is interesting that I run into a lot is, and it happens a lot with technical companies, mm -hmm. is the founders or the leadership tends to be too technical and too educated in their own software. So they don't realize that the consumer is not nearly as advanced in their solution as they are. Yeah. So their viewpoint of how to communicate something is super technical, super direct, because um, anything else to them seems like too dumbed down yeah infantile like, yeah mm -hmm. and the reality is not that me as a consumer are, are dumber than them it's like i don't think about cloud-based accounting software for 10 hours every single day so, <laughs> so you, almost... have, you have to like enter me through a you can educate me in the future but yeah. let me come in through a way that appeals to me yeah is it almost like your advice to these executives is like Nobody gives a damn about your product. Yeah. Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody cares. And they so don't you, today. They don't, yeah, they, don't, yeah, yeah. they don't care about those features today. We have to make them care about those features. Because there's too many options on the market? Is that part of it, you think? I'm sure that's that's one of them. You know, and and um, I'm sure Aflac has 
better pricing or better customer service or whatever it is, but I'll find that out after the caveman like <laughs> made me laugh and, and, and made me realize that, hey, shit, I haven't looked at my insurance for yeah. six years. Maybe I can get cost savings. And, and I keep hearing about this, like this one in the Super Bowl commercials with the caveman. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so they, 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 they've, they've given me a barrier. to They've lowered my barrier to entry. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to go do the real research. I do care about price. Uh, features, all that stuff after that. Yeah. It is is that an outdated reference at this point, the caveman? The cave I think so. <laughs> How old do you have to be to let's, I mean I, I recognize it. Let's but. go through the few good ones. We got Caveman. We got Discount uh, Double Check. Aaron Rodgers. Sorry. Keep man, going. I was gonna go the uh hump the hump uh, hump day hump, hump day. day. I think that's another Geico one. Then we had the really like Maybe. jacked dudes directing traffic. All right, let's segue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no <laughs> All right. Um, um, okay. So we talked about shortcomings. Um, I know you have, you have somewhere you want to go from here. So when we talk about shortcomings and then we talk about crafting a creative story, um, number one, where do you start? Right. I guess let me back up here. I'm sorry. I think let's go to the back end. Let's go to deployment. Deployment. Right? We've, we, we, we have this creative process that we think companies need to really think about. Mm-hmm. Um, and not to plug external agencies, but sometimes it does require external people to help drive creativity. Mm-hmm. Um, and even with our creative process, we typically bring people that are not involved with that client. Can you give me an example? It doesn't have to be specific, just in general. Of uh, what? Like bringing somebody in to help with the creative process. Oh, like for us, you know, we might bring a, a different account manager or, or individuals from the creative team that are not deeply involved in that specific partner. Obviously, they've been updated on the brief, but mm-hmm. it's just a totally different set of eyes because you're not deep in the shit, right? Sometimes yeah, yeah. we're so deep in our own projects that it's hard to like step away and be like, okay, how do we actually, Yeah. what is this thing? <laughs> um, can you cuss on podcasts? We can cuss. We can cuss. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, I just read a really good book called um, The Trillion Dollar Coach. It's about business coaching. And it has a really good data point around people that cuss in, the, in business settings. So, all right. Uh, so we, 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 we can work we them can, in. We we'll can work them in more. Yep. Cool. Um, um, so deployment. Let's go yeah. back to that. <clears throat> deployment to me is. Um, let's talk what we know, right? Let's talk performance marketing. Mm-hmm. So you have these fun creative campaigns. Right? You have this message. Now we have this superhero talking about accounting software. Um, but <laughs> you still have to plug in performance marketing. Right. And then that, to me, goes back to um, the A-B testing components Mm -hmm. of these creative ads. Just because it's fun and creative doesn't mean every ad is going to be a home run. How do we iterate? Right. How do we make sure that the superhero story being told communicates in a certain way, whether it's a top of funnel engagement ad to someone that may have never engaged with us? Or is it a remarketing ad where now we know they have education? um, Or is it a hard ask type of get your demo type of ad at the bottom of the funnel. Do you know what I think is important? It's obvious to us, but I think it's important to our listeners. We have all these creative campaigns that look sexy and maybe there's a common mindset amongst some of our uh, clients initially that how do we know we're targeting the right people? Like we have all this creative stuff. Yeah. I'm just putting it out there in the world and, and no is the answer, right? And yeah. so on the technical marketing side, we're putting together the audiences that we think resonate with your ICP mm-hmm. and then we're serving them that message. And I think we need to we need to talk about that at least for a second because uh, it goes understated too much. It's the, uh, it's the iceberg analogy, right? It's mm-hmm. like what they see versus, mm-hmm. what, <laughs> versus mm-hmm. what's under the water, right? What they see is that creative campaign. Exactly. Um, but behind it is what we're experts at, which is performance marketing. And I think that's why I call these creative performance campaigns right right um so like bringing creativity into performance marketing um and it's spot on it's it's optimization right deploying an ad campaign i always like to say is 10 percent of the work mm. <laughs> the 90 percent is like how do you optimize how do you make it successful how do you report on it how do you take actions based on the events that are yeah. happening right and that's where like the analyst in me um can geek out on and i think yeah. that's what i want to keep seeing in the world is that and that's just gonna get better and better. I mean, as soon as AI keeps going deeper into helping us analyze success of our ads, like the mm-hmm. data driven side is gonna keep growing. Mm-hmm. Um, and my my ask of us is that we let the creative side and the human side grow with it. 
you know, because I think that's how we're going to win. I like that. I, I think it's the, the right growth mindset to have. Um, now into our most popular segment, and I've been asking for images, imaging from our producers for mm-hmm. I don't know how long. Now. <laughs> um, but you got you got a cool stat, um, and I want you to uh, tie it back to what we've we've talked about as far as our creative process, and then obviously um, the stat that you have and, and what we're seeing in the world. What's the name? What's what's the name of the segment? The stack stat. Stack stat. Yeah, again, we need we need images. <laughs> Um, I got a fun stat today. Um, Consumers are 55% more likely to look up your brand specific terms after they've been exposed to display ads. Um, And and not just display ads like Google Display, but just anywhere they see your graphic, correct? Yeah. And and honestly, I think it's less about Google Display because that's not my favorite inventory. I think it's in this world, it's like social media, display Mm -hmm. advertising, YouTube advertising. Um, You know, and we've had other podcasts where we've talked about sometimes budget funnels into Google because it's easy attribution, mm-hmm. right? And this is a perfect example. Yeah, it's yeah. like the display is what's driving the search. Yeah. Um, but if they are a hun- if they're one hundred and fifty percent more likely to look up your brand after a display ad, think about how important that display ad is, mm-hmm. right? And it's is it your number one? cloud-based accounting software or is it um the superhero that's coming to save your finances especially when you're not working with the geico's and the state farms and the big boys right who have brand recognition yeah a lot of our prospects maybe see and learn about the client for the first time via our display ads Mm -hmm. and so if that's your first touch point better be a damn good one yeah better make me laugh it better make me stop and click on your ad um and that's what we excel at i think so i like that one i like the i like the i like that stat i think Mm -hmm. it's it paints a good picture for a lot of what we're trying to say, uh, not just across performance marketing campaigns, but around attribution and, and everything that's going on. Um, mm-hmm. I think that I love attribution, but if we, if and when we stop trying to prefer, perfect attribution, marketing is going to get better. Because yeah. you, you, you're yeah. not going to perfect, in today's world, you're not going to perfect attribution until some AI pixel gets deployed that tracks everything that we do, which yeah. inevitably will happen, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in my opinion. Of um, but today, that's not the reality. And we just have to really invest in non-one-to-one touch points all the time. Yeah. And, and check out our attribution uh, episode as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. A good, it's a good plug for that. So, um, all right. So, we know that for these brands that aren't huge and don't have brand recognition, that display ads and creativity, creativity are king. Um, what would you tell people to do if you didn't know what you were doing? Bad advice. What bad advice would you give folks that are looking to up their game and specifically uh, dip their toe into the creative waters? Segment number two, bad advice. Bad advice. The digital marketing world is full of bad advice. Um, and as a token marketer, we have to add to the, the noise. Okay. So creativity doesn't matter okay it's all today's world you can target so effectively Mm -hmm. right you have so much data out there just get it in front of the get it in front of the right prospect tell them it's the number one piece of cloud-based accounting software (laughs) what else do they need to know tyler we probably should have led with the segment after i said that content was king (laughs) you say content doesn't matter Um, they don't need to know anything else they just need if you get it in front of the right icp and you tell them it's the number one piece of accounting software they will buy so creativity is Bullshit. I don't I don't actually think this is bad advice depending on the client. Like if I'm mm-hmm. again Geico or some of these big boys, like that might be the right way to go. But when you're looking for a partner for your brand that's not well known and you tell <laughs> and you tell them creative creative doesn't matter, it's bad advice. Yeah. If it's bad advice. Um even if you are well known, the, the competition, whenever there's competition will eventually rise and someone's gonna resonate with the customer. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, the sales forces of the world will be leaders until they're not. So beware of anybody else who cracks the creative code, especially if you're one of the legacy companies. I think it's one of the 50 things they need to crack. They need a better product. They need better execution. They need better everything. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and there's, you know, we, we learned so much about legacy brands that just lost their, their touch. And I think it's important that you stay forward thinking and creative as a company. Speaking about forward thinking, let's predict the future here. 
Um, but before I kick it over to you, I think one thing that I see in the future is maybe more personalized content going back to our pixel conversation and how it's hard right now to have some of that personalized content just mm -hmm. with what we're able to track. Yeah. Um, predict the future for us. What do you see as far as changes in the creative game and how that impacts performance marketing? Ooh, I was listening to Post Malone <laughs> <laughs> on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. Gotcha. That's a good one. And he, he Post Malone is pretty um, nervous about what AI will do to music. Um, and one example he made was and Joe Rogan keeps pushing the, hey, I really think people want to hear you. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of agree, but I also agree with both sides. And Post Malone was saying, it is getting so good that eventually each individual person is going to be able to request a song that's specific to what they need, how they feel, the person they want to talk to, or the person they want in that song. Built or, by AI. Built by AI with Post Malone's voice. Yeah. And it'll be the most personalized song ever. And I'm going to not, and, and me, Post Malone, I'm not going to be able to compete with that. Maybe people will start listening to lyrics more. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like he's, like, he's like, AI will be able to build a song with my voice about his ex-girlfriend yeah. and their problems. And it's going to just hit super well. And it's going to be better than anything I could write. You remember when we uh, asked girls to prom and we had to write our own song? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you guys didn't do Man, that. My, uh, my, prom, uh, my prom request was very different from yours, I think. <laughs> I don't have much artistic talent, <laughs> but sorry, we're way off here. Post Malone's great, by the way. Um, predicting the future, I think there's a world where these, again, the the, the emergence of of creative and data driven, we might even be able to start to do really personalized, highly targeted ad creative that's specific for you. Tyler or you, Carlos. Yeah. And I think that's going to be really interesting. And how is it different from like, this is completely different because it's email, but I get an email that says, hi, Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh my God, <laughs> this is for me. Yeah. Um, Quick question. <laughs> yeah. 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 Why aren't you responding to my emails, Tyler? Yeah. And I think those turn me off immediately because yeah. A, as a marketer, I know it's just dynamic insertion as far as my first name. Yeah. How is that different from what we think we'll see in the future on ads and why when you personalize ads, it's definitely different from getting a spam email. Man, if I start running to ads that really know me well, mm -hmm. it's gonna be hard to ignore. How, know you well um, how? Who I am, what I do, what where do. I work. It might have real information of me at a display level. That's I haven't seen much of that. So I know Amazon's proprietary as far as the data that they have, but say somebody could tap into this proprietary data and see what you purchase. Mm -hmm. And then I can serve ads based on your interests. Right? Yeah. That might be one example. Yeah. And obviously we're not going to be able to tap into Amazon mm -hmm. data. But um, I think that's one thing I've seen in the past as far as analyzing these other channels for specific behavioral interest and then, you know, crafting your messaging campaign in a more general format that's not necessarily personalized. And in the future, instead of grouping together these interests and painting a broad brush, maybe each ad will be digitally crafted to a Daniel, to a Tom, to a yeah. Tyler. I don't know who Tom is. I see, I, you, uh, I see you bought a broom. I'm guessing you're someone that likes clean data hygiene in your CRM. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> All right. I think we'll wrap it up there, but this is always fun. Um, I think a, a, a takeaway from me, or I think the message that I want to get a Cross is the data is going to keep advancing, mm -hmm. and I think it's about to speed up faster than ever. And if we, in an AI-driven world, if we don't forget about the human and we mm -hmm. drive that forward together, that's how we're going to continue to win in digital advertising strategies. It's something that we're going to continue to invest in. If you want to learn more about our creative performance, camp performance campaigns, check us out at growwithom.com. And Tyler, I've had a blast today, so. Happy that we got to chat through it. It's been great. It's been great. And can I, I know you just did an outro. I want to do another outro. Do an outro. I do my own outro. Outro number two. Um, up, up. If I'm to like, everything we talked about today, if I'm to put it into like a kind of a person, like a profile of a person, I think it's like a, a nerd who's also really funny. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you need in the person that you hire to do your, your creative or your ads, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, your full stack marketing. You need the person who knows this stuff, who's also able to communicate and is funny. So um, think of Daniel and I as, as funny nerds mm -hmm. going yeah. forward. Super and, funny. And we'll mainly, <laughs> mainly me on the funny part, him on the Tyler on the nerd part. But yeah, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll take that. Thanks, guys. <laughs>